1967, Barbara Streisand was on stage giving one of her usual stellar performances when all of a sudden she forgot the words to one of her own songs. Whereas most public figures could laugh this off, Streisand couldn't. In an interview many years later, she recalled that she always worked hard to give a perfect performance and she wanted her audience to see her as perfect too. This one public mistake would haunt Streisand for decades and eventually see her seek treatment for social anxiety disorder. A diagnosis like this might come as a surprise for someone as outgoing and charismatic as Streisand. Just intuitively, many people think that someone with social anxiety would be shy and reserved and afraid to speak up from fear of being judged by others. And whilst this description is true for some people with social anxiety, there are many bold, outspoken and generally confident people who crumble under the pressure of certain social interactions like public speaking or performing. Scarlett Johansson and Whoopi Goldberg are two more celebrities with similar experiences. But why do some people have such an extreme fear of social interactions and being scrutinised by others? What is it about public speaking that makes it one of the most common fears in the world? Come with me, if you dare, and we'll take a look. People who are socially anxious fear and avoid the scrutiny of others. They are usually concerned that they'll say or do something to embarrass themselves or that others will judge them harshly. Just like with all anxiety disorders, they will avoid social situations or endure them with great discomfort. People with social anxiety also experience the same types of physiological symptoms that we saw with phobias, including racing heart, sweating and trembling. Thanks sympathetic nervous system, really appreciate that. People with social anxiety may have trouble concentrating during social encounters and all this can cause severe distress and impairment in a person's social relationships, their work and their education. Unlike specific phobias, social anxiety tends to affect cisgendered men and women at roughly the same rate and symptoms almost always develop in childhood or adolescence. So what's going on when someone has a social anxiety attack and why does it happen? In 1995, researchers David Clark and Adrian Wells proposed a model of social anxiety disorder that focused on the role of cognitive factors, the negative schemas and appraisals that people have about social situations. Clark and Wells propose that at some point in the socially anxious person's life, they've had a really negative social experience or sometimes a series of them. In Barbara Streisand's case, it was forgetting the words to her own song in front of thousands of people. This negative life experience creates negative schemas about social interactions. And these schemas can be pretty specific. In the case of Barbara Streisand and Scarlett Johansson, the fear was specific to the performing. Other social experiences like chatting with friends weren't affected. Now, what have we already learned about schemas? That's right, our schemas influence our appraisals of different situations. So, when the individual enters a social situation, their negative social schema becomes activated. They appraise the social situation as scary and it causes their attention to shift from focusing on what's going on in the outside world to focusing on themselves and the physiological sensations in their body. This is called self-focused attention. Unfortunately, because the person is paying so much attention to themselves, they neglect the social cues that they're supposed to be paying attention to. The consequences of this are twofold. Firstly, because the person is directing all their attention to themselves, they not only feel like the center of attention, they also become hypersensitive to any physiological changes that happen in their bodies. This increased self-focused attention causes them to notice their heart beating faster. They notice the moment they begin to blush, that first bead of sweat that forms on their brow. This then creates the second problem. The person interprets these physiological signals as evidence that they must be performing poorly in the social interaction. They're convinced that their heart racing and their cheeks blushing is evidence of their social awkwardness. 
They create this negative image of themselves in social interactions that they assume reflects what other people think of them as well. This in turn exacerbates their physiological symptoms of fear, creating a vicious cycle. What's really interesting is that people with social anxiety feel like everyone is watching them, but they don't base this feeling on actual observations of other people's behaviour. They don't say, I saw everyone staring at me. Instead, they report things like, I just know everyone was staring at me. They notice their own physiological reactions like blushing, and they interpret that information as if it's relevant to other people's opinion of them. This is an example of that emotional reasoning thought error we spoke about in our depression lectures. Note that, just like in depression, the person with social anxiety is basing their evaluation of the situation on their emotional state rather than observing the actual state of the world. Clark and Wells reported, quote, the social phobic equates feeling humiliated with being humiliated, feeling out of control with being out of control, and feeling anxious with being noticeably anxious. This is the Clark and Wells cognitive model in diagrammatic form. The person enters the social situation, which activates that social schema. All their assumptions surrounding the social situation and their place within them. This negative social schema then causes the person to interpret that the social situation is dangerous. Remember, our schemas influence our appraisals. Now, not only does this perceived danger trigger all the physiological, cognitive and behavioural symptoms of fear, it's also this negative appraisal of social situations that causes the person to increase their self-focused attention. In the diagram, Clark and Wells describe this as a person processing themselves as a social object, the centre of attention. This increased self-focused attention just enhances their belief that social situations are scary, which in turn, which in turn increases those somatic, cognitive and behavioural symptoms of fear, and so the whole dysfunctional cycle becomes strengthened once again. We spoke both in the depression lectures and also our phobia lectures about avoidance or safety behaviours. What we concluded was that safety behaviours play a big role in the maintenance of these mental disorders because the person never learns that the bad situation isn't actually that bad. As you probably guessed, safety behaviours play a big role in maintaining social anxiety too. Some of the common safety behaviours are avoiding social situations, drinking alcohol before or during social events to take the edge off the nervousness, and looking at your phone when you're not sure what to say or do in public. Someone who is anxious about public speaking might over-rehearse their speech until they know it back to front and inside out. Now, just like safety behaviours with phobias, these social safety behaviours get negatively reinforced when they're performed because they reduce the person's anxiety temporarily. But unfortunately, if the situation is avoided, the person never gets to undertake that new extinction learning. They never get the opportunity to learn that social situations aren't as scary as they thought they were. This is the second part in Maurer's two-stage model that we spoke about last time. On the other hand, if the person engages in the safety behaviour, say looking at their phone or drinking alcohol, and they're okay, their learning gets all muddled. Are they feeling okay in the social situation because they're not actually socially inept, or are they feeling okay because they performed their safety behaviour? What's more, some safety behaviours, such as drinking to excess, can actually increase a person's chances of behaving inappropriately, and this only serves to confirm their belief that they're not good in social situations. So how is social anxiety treated? Well, just like depression and other anxiety disorders, there are a variety of treatment strategies available. Because both cognitive and behavioural aspects are central to the maintenance of social anxiety, one of the most effective treatments is CBT. The therapist and the client work to get to the heart of those negative schemas and appraisals and challenge them so that they can be replaced with more realistic beliefs. If we think back to Barbara Streisand, part of her dysfunctional social schema was her incredibly strong desire to be seen as perfect by her audience. She recalled that part of her therapy involved dismantling that idea. No performance is perfect and no person is perfect. A person striving for absolute perfection will always be disappointed because it's actually impossible to achieve what they're striving for. 
Another part of therapy is challenging those thought errors. People with social anxiety interpret their physiological symptoms as evidence that the other person is thinking bad things about them. What CBT can do is help the person redirect their attention onto the other person's social cues and to use those cues to gather information rather than relying on irrelevant cues like their heartbeat. Another crucial part of the CBT is to convince the person to forgo their safety behaviours. The reason this is so critical is so that the person can undergo new extinction learning, so that they can learn that social situations are not scary. The other person is behaving in a way that tells me that they're interested in what I'm saying, so I must actually be doing a good job in this social interaction. Furthermore, the reason I'm doing well in this social interaction is not because I had a few beers before I came out. I didn't perform that safety behaviour, so I know I'm responsible for my good social performance. It was all me. Thanks for watching. Today we spoke about social anxiety disorder and its symptoms. We covered the Clark and Wells cognitive model of social anxiety and how this model explains the maintenance of the disorder. We also saw how this model informs treatment for social anxiety and the components of CBT to help that treatment be successful. Next week, we're going to look at a class of disorders that used to be classified as anxiety disorders, but have now been moved into a category all of their very own, the obsessive compulsive disorders. Scarlett Johansson and Wolfie Goldberg are two more celebrities with similar experiences. Scarlett. Are you going to go out? <laughs> unfortunately, because the person is paying so much attention to themselves that they, unfortunately, this, unfortunately, I can't speak.